this this morning we lift our voice to worship you oh God because you are worthy of our praise we bow before you this morning we want to honor you we give you all the praise and honor and glory you are worthy you are worthy so this morning oh God we come we ask of you to come into our lives this morning, oh God. Help us to settle in, Lord. Put aside all the distractions, all the things that is pulling us away from you this morning. We just ask of you, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, minister to us this morning. us a fresh touch this morning, God. We long to see your face this morning, God. We come before you right now in Jesus' name. We want to give ourselves to you, Lord. Fully devoted to you and you alone. We want to dedicate our lives to, to complete, to accomplish your mission on this earth until you call us home. This morning, oh God, we pray for, for Afghanistan and those Christians over there. We pray that God, you minister to them. We pray that God, you, 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 you watch over them. In the midst of the war and, 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 and all the battles going on, we just ask you, Lord, that your peace that surpass all understanding be with them. Lord. And we think about the tension between China, Taiwan, and U.S. Lord, we pray for those leaders. We pray that God, you intervene the situation. You bring the peace upon these lands. And we pray for those natural disasters that is happening right now too. We think about the, 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 the uh, Spain and, and, and the volcano activities and the volcanic activities and, and think about uh, a Greece that, that is uh, currently under the flood. Lord, give those leaders wisdom to take care of the people there. To be able to manage the disaster. Oh, Lord, we pray for our country too, oh God. We just lift up all of our leaders, uh, our uh, governor, governor, governor general, and, and the prime ministers, and, and, and all the cabinet ministers and and all the members of the parliaments and even the councils of the cities and the mayors and the premiers we all we lift them all up to you God this morning and we pray for them Lord right now we ask you Lord to have mercy on them to give them the wisdom you bestow your power upon the government to watch over us. So we, we, we pray for them. We pray for their family. We pray a blessings upon the leaders of the country. Speak to them, O oh God, that they may know your will to lead our country. this morning to speak to us. Thank you so much, God. Thank you so much. In 
Jesus' most precious name we pray and everyone say amen and amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning, church. And those who are watching online this morning, so good to see all of you this morning. Today we continue our series. Let me ask you a question. How often do you pray? What do you pray about? And what motivates you to pray? Probably is not so good time. Paul here urged Timothy to pray for all people. And the truth is this. God calls us to pray for the people worldwide to, to be saved and to experience peace with God. And so chapter 1, we looked at it last two weeks and, and, and we look at the importance aspect of, of, the, of the right doctrine, the right teaching. We, we need to have this right teaching. The teaching must be true to the Word of God. Unfortunately, those, those false teachers, they made the church about themselves. The church is about God and Jesus. It's about the gospel message. It's not about them. It's about Jesus came to this world to save sinners. That's what the Bible was saying. At the end of the chapter, Paul says to, with the, about the uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander and to be turned to Satan to teach them a lesson not to blaspheme God. Now, today we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. And you see that Paul points out the important aspect of prayers. You see that the church is sent forth with the gospel message. But unfortunately, people like Hemenes and Alexander, they distort the gospel truth. They lost their missionary focus. And so Paul continued to urge Timothy to, to, and, and the church to pray and to refocus on God and his mission. It is great that we can all gather together, especially during this time of the pandemics. We can gather together. It's great. We gather together here with people to share our common interests and values. That's not a problem at all. But remember, Paul says, remember our focus. Our focus is that we are called to reach the world. Remember, Jesus came to this world to save sinners. We're called to proclaim the gospel, not to protect our self-interest or values like the club. So Paul reminds Timothy that two things. Number one, our heart must come in line with God's heart. And number two, God desires all people to be saved. So one of the indicators that we keep in line with God and his mission is the way we pray. Paul shows three prayer uh, focus for Christians to keep in line with God and his mission. So point number one, pray with all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people. And you see that in verse 1 to 2, I urge you, this is Paul, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on, on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for the kings and all who are in authority, so that we can live peacefully and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Pray with all kinds of prayers. 
Paul wants the church to be a praying church with all kinds of prayers. You see that Paul used four distinctive and yet very closely related words to talk about our prayers. You see that in this verse here, he, he used the word prayer and, and ask, intercede, and thanksgiving. Now, the NIV would use petition, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving. These are four closely related words about prayer. All Paul 1 is trying to communicate to us is that the church used all kinds of prayers to pray for all kinds of people. Prayer reminds us that God is in control. Not the environment, not the people, not the kings, not the rulers, not the pastors, but God and God alone is in control. When we pray, when we talk to God, He hears our prayers. He is, his ears are attentive to our prayers. He is interested in what you have to say to Him. All of your prayer items. Prayer is what Paul is trying to drive his point. The important aspect, the priority for the church is to pray. First of all, prayer is more than religious activities. When we pray, we bring heaven down to earth and we meet God together. We encounter God. We engage with God in our prayers. We're just 50 centimeters away from from the throne of grace. Yes, all of us, you're about 50 centimeters away from the throne of grace. That's the distance between your knees to the ground. We come before God. We bow down before Him. And we pray to God. We ask God to listen to our prayers. The content of our prayers shows we value what we value the most. For the past 18 months, I'm sure many, many prayers went to our health, our safety, the protection. And Paul is saying that these are good things. You should pray for these things. But remember, don't forget our primary calling our primary calling is that we should pray for our boldness the power for witness and the gospel advancement in this dying world so we should also pray for all kinds of people and paul says that in in verse one here to pray for all people in the first century church that makes up is the, the Jews and the Gentiles, they're all together in the same church. So they pray for one another. So the Jews will pray for the Gentiles and the Gentiles will pray for the Jews. They pray for one another, not just for their own needs, but other people's needs. So our prayer is that we must embrace people around us and around the world, and those who are near us and dearest to us. So Paul here in verse 2 tells us that pray this way for kings and all who are in authority. Kings, rulers, those hold authority in the city, in the country. People like the prime ministers, the presidents of the countries. It could be the superintendent of, of, of a school or maybe those mayors, maybe denominational leaders, uh, maybe pastors of a church. Pray for those with the authority that makes decisions about our lives. But you may say, well, Rex, you know what? But, but these people are, 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 are bad. They're, they're evil. 
Do, do I pray for them? Uh, yeah, well, that's what Paul is trying to say here. Pray for them. Pray for the leaders. Pray for the kings and the rulers. Yes, rather than complaining about them on your Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, Paul is trying to say that Christians, we are to pray for the good and the well-being of our leaders. Paul would have Nero, the Roman emperor, in mind when he talked about this. Pray for the king that you suffer under. Pray for the leaders that you disagree with. And pray for the rulers that you disapprove for. Prayer or praying for them is God's will. It's God's will. Don't forget to pray for these people. No matter how disapproved you are or disagree you are, pray for them. Ask God to intercede. Ask God to work with these people to change the city, to change the province, to change the country. We may not be persecuted like the first century Christian but we must pray for our government. There are three levels of the government in, in our country, where the federal, provincial, and municipal. Pray for these three governments. People like our governor general, Mary May Simon, the prime minister, Justin Trudeau. Pray for the premier, John Horgan. Uh, uh, mayors like Kennedy Stewart. Mike Hurley, Malcolm Brody, Doug, uh, Doug McCallum, Richard Stewart, all these people, all of the, the cabinet minister, parliament, uh, members of the parliament, the city councils, all of these people, pray for them, bless them. When you pray for our leaders of the country, you bless them, not curse them. And, and remember other countries too. Pray for countries like uh, Libya, Israel, Iran, Afghanistan, all of these places. Imagine what the city or what the country would be like if the government and the leaders would listen and obey God. Friends, channel our energy to pray on our knees before God and let our prayers penetrate God's throne of grace so that God's will and God's mission will continue to advance on earth. So point number two, pray for peace for Christians and salvation for others. Paul said this again in verse 2, so that we can live peacefully and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Well, Paul here is not saying that we should just pray for the leader so that all the Christian can live stress-free and happy life from now on. That, that's not what Paul is trying to say here. Paul is trying to say that he wants peace Amid persecution. Remember, Nero is in power. He is persecuting Christian at this point of time. Paul wants the church to pray for peace and freedom of all the Christians from persecution. The hostility may grow in some Christians' heart towards those who persecute them. Yet, Paul says, pray for the leaders, the kings, the rulers. Pray that the church will be prepared and equipped to live lives of godliness, dignity, amid persecution. Pray for the leaders to provide an umbrella of peace, for the church to thrive and the gospel message to proclaim freely in the midst of persecution. 
Christian can freely live out the call of Christ and demonstrate the godly and the peaceful life of Christ so that all can see. In May 1989, uh, uh, Lisette, or Lisette, uh, Lisette, a small town in Germany, a group of people gathered together in a room in the, at the famous St. Nicholas Church where the Reform, Reformation was introduced. They read the Sermon on the Mount and pray for peace. They were quickly expanded and moved to a larger room. Soon after, they begin to meet in the sanctuary. And even after that, they begin quickly fill up the place. Their gathering began to concern the communist authorities. So they send officials to attend their meetings. And the authorities threaten the gatherers and temporarily jail some of them. On their prayer nights, they block off the cities near the Autobahn, the, the highway off Ram. Five months later, on October 9th, 1989, some 2,000 individuals crowded in prayer for peace at the church, and another 10,000 people gather outside of the church. And soon after that, the Berlin Wall came down. Was it a coincidence? Probably not. Probably not. Prayer for peace brought down the Berlin Wall. This was a kind of the response of a caring and almighty God to the prayers of his people. When we pray, when we come together and we pray, God will answer in his time. Imagine what would the church and the gospel be like if a large group of people come together and pray. Pray for one another. Pray for unified passion and focus. A unified passion and focus. The mighty wall of unbelief would fall. Personal weakness would penetrate the strongholds with the mighty power of Christ. Remember to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for those who live in places like Egypt. China, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, maybe even North Korea, where peace is not easy to come by. Pray for the leaders to provide protection that promotes peace and enable the gospel and the church to flourish. God wants leaders to be saved too. You will see that in verse 3 and 4. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Praying for someone's salvation is good and pleasing to God. That's what Paul is saying here. God wants everyone, including the leaders or those who are in authority, to be saved and to understand the truth. Jesus, on the day of his crucifixion, he shared with the official, Pontius Pilate, and caused him to think, what is the truth? God wants them to be saved. It is true that he does not want people to perish. But it does not mean that 
is a universal salvation. God wants people to be saved, but it's not automatically people will, will become Christian. Still truth, Ephesians 2, 8. It is by grace, through faith, that you have been saved. It is not our human effort. Here, Paul wants Christians to pray for the rulers, the leaders, the enemies, and even those people who persecute them, that they would be saved and to understand the truth. John Chrysostom said this, it is much more difficult to hate someone when we are praying for them. It is impossible to despise someone when you are uh, praying and asking God to bless them. When, when, when you pray for someone, you can begin to love, to care for that person. You, you are less likely to despise, to react negatively against that person. Do you know that? When you pray for someone for salvation, God uses your prayer to accomplish His will. So friends, we are on a life-saving mission here. Paul urges us to pray for the salvation for our friends, our family, our relatives, and those who are lost, perishing, and on their way to the eternal, everlasting suffering. Help them, Lord, to understand your truth, the gospel truth. Chuck Colson was a chief counselor to President Richard Nixon. On March 1974, he learned a lesson when he was indicted for conspiring to cover up the Watergate scandal. His close friends, Thomas Phillips, told him about his wonderful experience meeting Jesus Christ. Then Thomas witnessed to Chuck with the Bible and with C.S. Lewis' famous book, Mere Christianity. Thomas' message was so powerful that Chuck broke down while he was sitting in a car on the driveway of Thomas. And he invited Jesus to come into his life. And then he asked Jesus to be his personal Savior, Lord, and King. And here is what Chuck said. I know the resurrection is the fact. And Watergate prove it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years. Never once denied it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate and boiled 12 of them, powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. After his release from prison, God used Chuck to start a prison ministry called Prison Fellowship in 1976, reaching out to prisoners. He helped thousands of, thousands of uh, prisoners coming to faith. When one sinner turned to God, God rejoices with angels in heavens. And so are we. We rejoice one person coming to faith. Can you imagine you reach out to a friend like Chuck Colson? A prisoner. A liar. 
full of scandal. And yet, God used him to reach out to so many prisoners that you and I are unable to reach. So friends, when we're busy about sharing the good news with other people, we are living a life pleasing to God. So friends, keep on praying for your spouse, your family, relatives, friends, your classmates, your co-workers. Like Thomas sharing the good news to Chuck Colson. You too can share the good news of the gospel with other people. God desires for people to be saved. And my last point is this. Pray that people will worship the one true God. The reason why we pray is that God deserves all of the honors and praise of all the people. Listen to verse 5 to 7. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message of God that gave to this world at just the right time. And I have been chosen as a preacher and the, and the apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating. I am telling the truth. There is only one true God in this world. In Ephesus, a place with religious diversity. There are so many different gods in their religious system. Artemis, a goddess of fertility. If your wife wants to get pregnant, go and pray to her. If you want to find a spouse, you can worship the god of Cupid with the bow and arrow, but not, not a fat baby, okay? Uh, if you want to, to go on a sea journey, you pray to Neptune. So there are at least about 50 different kind of gods in, 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 in their worship or in their religious system in Ephesus. A person in their lifetime would worship many, many different gods. And to them, there's no conflict because each god is dedicated for one thing. There's no conflict for them to worship many gods. But that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying to these people, listen, guys, there's only one true God. Paul wants to teach the church and the people one crucial lesson. There is only one true God and all other gods are false. We pray for the people for their salvation so that they may bow before the one true God and worship Him. We come together as believers, and we pray together, we worship together to the one true God. We look forward to one day when all of the believers gather together in heaven to worship the one true God forever and ever. Our God is a great God. Chris Tomlin sang this. Our God is greater, stronger, higher than any others. This true God knows our problem. We have a problem. And we have sin, and sin separates us from God. We cannot save ourselves. He has a perfect solution for our problem. And there's one mediator, Jesus Christ. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone who believes in him. There's one mediator, Jesus Christ, who died to free us. God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, as the mediator to reconcile humanity to God. 
You may say, well, but, but I thought you just said there's one true God. And now you have uh, one true God and uh, one mediator. Uh, Yeah, because God is three persons in one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's not three gods, but one God, three different persons. You can almost imagine like the, the, the egg, an egg. The egg has the shell. You have the egg white and the egg yolk. It's only one egg. It's not three eggs. So, so Jesus is the son of God. He is the mediator between God and humanity. He came down on earth and took the form of human. So Jesus is not just 100% human. He is 100% human, and he is also 100% God. And because of his supernatural nature, 100% human, 100% God, that he was able to sacrifice himself on the cross and save humanity. Jesus came and became like us. He took our place. He gave himself as a ransom by dying for us on the cross. We couldn't pay the price that needed to be paid. Only God and God alone could pay that price. Do you know that Father God loves you? He sent his son to give up, to give up his life for you. You can surrender yourself. You turn away from your sins. And God will rescue you. Robert and James were friends from their childhood days. Robert had no interest in studying at all. So he involved himself in theft and led to a wretched wretched life. But not for James. James tried to correct his friend's but in vain. Instead, James decided to study law. And he had no contact with each other for many, many years. Finally, Robert was caught in a murder case. He was imprisoned and brought to court. There he saw James sitting on the judge seat. Robert thought, wow, here's my chance. I can get free because I know the judge. And James looked at him. He recognized his old friend. So he asked around and inquired about the case. And then he went back to his seat. Then he find Robert heavily. And Robert couldn't believe his ears. How could my friend do this to me? How am I going to pay this fine? Even if I have to work for the rest of my life, I could not pay for that fine. And after the judgment pronounced, you see that James came down towards Robert. And he took out his checkbook. He wrote a check with the exact amount. Then he gave it to Robert. He said, here. I've paid your penalty. You're free to go. Robert couldn't believe what James did for him. From that moment on, he decided to be a good person. No more sin. Robert was ransomed when James paid the money to buy his freedom. 
God rescue us from sin and death. No money could buy. Only the precious blood of Jesus can save us. And if you believe in Jesus, you too can receive this eternal gift of salvation. Jesus, Son of God, by sacrificing Himself on the cross, He set us free. So let us not dwell in the past. Let us grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and press towards the goal to win the prize towards for, for which that God has given us heavenward through Jesus Christ. I want to invite the musicians to come forward again. We're going to sing this song, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. We have been saved by God's grace. Therefore, you no longer live, but Christ lives in you. And for those who want to receive Jesus as your personal Savior, Lord, and King, I want to invite you to pray right now that Jesus come into my heart just like Chuck Colson, save me from all of my sins and, and all of the wrongdoing that I had done before. Today, I'm a new person. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Jesus. 
we can do all things through Christ who strengthened us. I have been crucified with Christ, and therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Thank you so much, God. In Jesus' most precious name, we pray. And everyone say, Amen and Amen. Please be seated.